Hello, Cinema Makeup School friends, fam, students, and followers. Thank you guys so much for watching another one of our industry interviews. Today, we are lucky to have specialty makeup artist Brian Seip join us. You've definitely seen his work, I promise you, but we're going to talk all about that in today's episode. Brian, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Before we get started into your beginnings, tell me a little bit about what you like to promote as your career. Well, I mean, I guess... I guess everything, you know, I mean, I, I'm a specialty makeup artist. Um, you know, I, I've, I came up in a time in this industry where we had to know how to do a little bit of everything. Um, my early career uh, obviously focused mostly on prosthetic makeup. Um, and, uh, you know, now in my, you know, the, the latter half of my career, I'll say, uh, you know, focusing on just kind of the overall picture, you know, including um, contemporary makeup, corrective, uh, as well as the prosthetic and, and character design, uh, you know, overall. Yeah, and I'm, I'm really fascinated with your career because you do do design, but you also manage projects. So it's more than just being like a singular artist. You are a leader and you also have a studio. You do all sorts of things. So before we get into any of those specifics, tell me about your beginnings as a makeup artist. Well, I grew up uh, in a little town called Hillsboro, Oregon, just outside of Portland. Um, and, you know, as you can imagine, it was uh, a long way from Hollywood, a long way from materials, a long way from anything. So uh, the best I had was to, you know, um, magazines, watching movies, um, and then just trying to copy what, you know, what I saw. Uh, I mean, I did, you know, we had to be resourceful uh, to do a head cast. You know, I did find a dental supply lab close by that, you know, I was able to get alginate and do life casts off of, you know, willing friends. And, um, you know, just kind of started that way, really. So a little bit of teaching yourself, just kind of finding what you can get into. What what kind of turned for you where it turned into, this is going to be a career for me? Um, let's see. Well, I guess it would have been 1981, 82, uh, when the VHS copy of uh, The Thing came out. I watched that a lot. I think it was around that time too. I mean, American Werewolf, Friday, the Friday the 13th series, um, uh, you know, all that stuff was coming out, The Howling. And um, I, I really got interested in it. And um, my father... Uh, traveled for work and he was at an airport magazine stand one time and he saw uh, the issue of Cinema Fantastique with uh, Rob Bottin on the cover and he recognized that as you know the head from the thing he grabbed it and um, brought it home and I mean I devoured it you know just page to page just you know uh, going through every page um, and it was a it was a really neat um, article that they wrote on the thing um, they had like these little Mike Plug drawings, um, you know, kind of like cartoon versions of how they did stuff, um, you know, with, with uh, and then descriptions written in there, like how they approached some of the effects. Um, and I think it was at that time when, you know, just looking at that, that I realized, oh, this is a job. This is something that someone can do. So that's where I, you know, the the fans of just watching horror movies and monster movies became career path. Yeah, that's uh, so great because so many people are like, you do your art and you're like, oh, this is fun. This is a hobby. But then you, see, you when it clicks in your head that the things you admire, someone got paid to do that. It's a real job. Yeah. And I think actually that my first experience into that, my first foray was, uh, I think it was in the back of a Fangoria magazine. Um, and it was a, it was a small little ad in the back when they used to have ads. Um, and it was a, a, it was a week long makeup workshop in New York and um, by a guy named Burt Roth, who I think was like one of the former ABC department heads. Um, so I did that, you know, I went, I went out to New York, I think I was 18 and uh, stayed with family, friends in Jersey, took the bus in to old 42nd Street, um, old New York Times Square <laughs> area where uh, Port Authority was pretty dodgy back then. Um, and uh, yeah, walked up um, towards the park. We all, it was like about five or six of us in this guy's apartment. And he just kind of taught us how to do a bald cap. He taught us how to lay a beard. He taught us, you know, some, some basic bruising and, and how to make cuts. Um, and uh, that's, that's kind of like where it really started to cement for me. What are one of the first uh, projects that you did where it was really clicking to you that this is the thing you can do? 
I mean, well, I think by the time I got into a project, I was already kind of invested. So, uh, you know, was, I think after that class um, is when I, I saw another ad in Fangoria for a makeup school that was opening up in Los Angeles. So I made the decision at that point to, I, you know, loaded up my car and, and drove to California. I stayed with an aunt and, you know, went to makeup school um, at a place that's not there anymore. Uh, it was over by Universal Studios. And uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it was a five month course. Um, it was, I was, I think I was the very first student to sign up in this class, in this school. Um, there's actually quite a few people in our industry that went to it. Um, but, uh, I think I was number one and he was actually even still just kind of like learning what he was going to do as a teacher. I, you know, what I learned, I think I learned a lot of good foundational basics. And then from there, you know, you, you, you it's, it's just all about how much time, you know, you put practicing and just, you know, making those connections, you know, meeting other people that have different skill sets and learning from them and then practicing more, you know, so. so. Tell me a little bit more about the school experience because we've got our cinema makeup school students. What kind of value did you find from going to school? I, well, I think one of the values that I found going to the school is, is just the camaraderie. You know, again, this was, this was a very new school. Um, and so all the people there, you know, we were all kind of learning together um, as well as the teacher. Um, but it was that competitive, comparison camaraderie. You know, you could like kind of see what somebody's doing and think, okay, well, I gotta go, I gotta either up myself or like, oh, good shot, you know, great, I can see what you're doing. And, you know, and I can do something like that too, because I couldn't figure that out. Um, you know, that a lot of the times, even in watching a video, it's, you know, it's like somebody texturing something and you're like, oh, great, that's how he textures. But until you actually start doing it, you know, it's, it's just like finding the amount of pressure, finding the angle, finding, you know, I mean, there's, there's you know, half a dozen things that go into anything that um, unless you're there with somebody sometimes, like doing it and showing you and, you know, it, it's, it's, it's sometimes can be really hard to grasp. You had mentioned the camaraderie there. Are there a lot of those folks that you went to school with that you still work with? They're still part of your posse? Um, there's not necessarily a part of my posse, but I still keep in touch with a couple of them. It's funny. I mean, I've, I have found out after the fact, like a bunch of the people who are still, you know, who are still in the business and, and you know, are, I mean, big players in our industry that, you know, that went to the school, you know, which I, I find it's funny, you know, it's, it's, it's funny to uh, reminisce about having that hands-on experience is so much different than like just practicing on yourself and having like, you know, being able to have an instructor or at least other eyeballs to see what you're doing to help right. you improve. Uh, sure. What was one of your first projects that you got on? I think one of the first projects out of that makeup school, uh, myself and another friend who went to that school, we did, we did a, um, a really bad low budget movie called uh, Cannibal Hookers. So number, the first thing listed on my IMDb, um, you know, I, I, can't seem to take myself to take it off there but it's uh you know well, you have to kind of like yeah you know those, yeah. like respect that's where you came from that's the beginning you know and then we go to over here so we want to do cannibal hookers too though we want to do cannibal hookers too yeah Yo, bring it back i see like a lot in your early career and uh those of you who are not familiar with brian's work definitely check out his website briansype.com you can see a whole list of his resume and different projects he's worked on as well as details of what he did on these various projects but like so many like classic movies that i see in your early career like suburban commando i remember watching that as a kid mm. and loving that bicentennial man idle hands of course the tank girl was like fantastic what did you do in these early stages of your career what kind of work were you doing on these projects when i started in the industry was uh right around 1980 nine mm -hmm. so uh you know the the heyday was still kind of happening in you know the makeup effects world and um uh, I, I was lucky enough to get in and i think at a time that we were all you know we were all still learning i mean there was it was still an introduction to so many materials and i mean every every new project you're trying to figure something out but you know there's there's quite a few materials out there now that have been figured out that you know that you know we were still trying to do back then and um, I was lucky enough uh, to, to get into some great shops, you know, I mean, my, my first um, professional shop, you know, my first professional film was uh, an 89, I think, um, Highway to Hell, um, you know, and that was, uh, you know, for Steve Johnson at XFX. And, um, you know, I mean, that's, you know, I, I was, 
uh, again, lucky enough to, to and fortunate enough to, uh, be, I think, be at the right place at the right time. I, you know, I heard a saying the other day, it was uh, luck equals uh, what, preparation and opportunity. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and I was lucky, I was ready. Um, I was, I had been kind of just kind of dinking around LA. I worked at a dinosaur company. We made like these robotic animatronic dinosaurs for museums and, um, you know, being able to get into you know steve johnson's shop as one of my first jobs was uh was amazing because you know he was he was an innovator uh you know at that time he'd already had a great resume himself and you know and he was one of my idols you know and a, a great mentor to me yeah that's gonna be great when you can get a job with one of your idols and then you're like yeah. oh wow we can really really make this happen in addition to being a makeup artist you do a lot of work now as a mark makeup department head when did you start to lead teams i guess like not actually not long after that uh, i mean even during highway to hell um steve uh and some of the shop uh, members you know they went off to location um and i think i had shown enough I guess gumption that uh, Steve, you know, he he did put me in charge of, of doing some things at the shop and, and just kind of making sure that things moved forward. And then that's one thing that I think I've been able to do at a lot of the shops that I've worked at is to, you know, be put into a, a supervisory position. Um, I think as people have noticed that that's, I guess that's something that's in my ingrained in me is to you know to um to manage well which i think is something you know be, besides being artistic is something that you really have to concentrate on in in this business um you know to to be relevant is that something that you feel comes naturally the that leadership or is it something that can be trained into you if you're a good makeup artist and you work well and you work well with other people then you'll get more responsibility and then from there you'll get more responsibility and from that if you do good you get more and then you do good you get more and it grows to that point where you um think okay well maybe i can lead a team you know maybe i can lead more people maybe i can lead background maybe i can do this and then i think you kind of get there because i think that's just something that you'll grow to because you might hate it <laughs> you not like it. yeah what are some of the cons to being a makeup department head you know what? Uh, there are a lot of cons. I mean, because that's 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 there's a lot of pressure. I mean, you know, we, we all have the pressure uh, of doing a good job. Um, but I think you know the department head sometimes. I mean, you know, they might have you know the the pressure ex, extra added pressure of this, the nature of design for the show. Um, you know, sometimes movies you know it's, it's inherent or the studios come with it. But there's that. I mean, you've got to really then deal with. Your crew, which is, you know, 20 different personalities, as well as the personalities of all the other department heads, and then the, you know, the producers and the studio. So, uh, I mean, you, you, you really have to know how to play nice in the sandbox and, and know how to um, deal with and talk with people, you know, not just your crew. Do, do you miss just being part of the crew and not being the one in charge? Yeah, well, you know what, I think I've been lucky enough that uh, that my career and even over the past few years is like, I'll, I'll do a show and then, you know, once you know, if my show goes down, then I'll go over, you know, like I went over and, you know, did a couple of days on, you know, on, on Star Trek for James McKinnon and, you know, and it was just like, great, you know, I can come here and just play, you know, and uh, yeah, no, it's always, it's always nice to be able to do that. Yeah, that's great because you can you can be makeup department head over here, but then you can pop over here and just help out on being part of the crew. You can you can be flexible. It's not that once you reach a certain level, you can't move up and down in the ranks. Right, right. I mean, there's some people that can't. Some people that don't want to. You know, some people that might maybe make it a political move to just be like, I'm not going to do any of that because I want to stay here. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I think it's if you're always working. Um, I think you're always learning, you know, I mean, I've, I've learned more just being in a trailer with people that I think are really good and just watching what they do, you know, I mean, that's, that's, that's the best thing ever, you know, just to, you know, watch anybody, whether it's going to be how, you know, somebody does eyelashes to, you know, how they, you know, how they hold the pencil when they do an eyebrow or how somebody, you know, the way or where they begin to glue their prosthetics it's it's everything's different and every you know and everybody approaches it differently um so it's always a great thing to be able to you know have the opportunity to be a fly on the wall you know around a lot of talented people yeah it sounds like it's it's super uh, advantageous to just try to work whenever you can at whatever level you can just so you can learn 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I had, you know, again, a great opportunity um, years ago when I, I was uh, uh, Jeannie Van Few, who recently passed away. Um, she, she gave me the opportunity to, to work background on a show she was working on because she knew that, you know, I wanted to up my, you know, correct makeup game. You know, I'd just been doing prosthetics. So she just like hired me and just, you know, put me in background and just like go. You know, and I was like, a t I think it was a tier one or a tier zero show. And, you know, I was there for three or four weeks and, you know, and just, you know, got to play and, and just got to work on my skill, you know, see other people, see what they were doing, you know, get critiqued, you know, ask her, you know, as my boss, it's like, how am I doing? <laughs> you know, um, that's what I do. I mean. Speaking of uh, critique, that's something that a lot of the professional makeup artists that I talk to very much drive in the point that you should accept critique. So tell me your stance on that, because I know sometimes it is hard for people to take criticism, but how yeah, do you make the yeah. criticism into a positive in your mind? I try not to candy coat too much um, without deflating somebody. I might always say part of my critique in jest, uh, but you know, it's all gonna be very truthful. If, if they're coming to me, you know, out of, out, of, out of a thousand people they could have chose, I'm going to give my opinion. And, and that's just, it's just it. That's just my opinion based on my tastes, based on how I look at it, based on, you know, how I think they might have done or how I think they could have done. You know, I've taught a lot. And, and, and I think that it's, I think the unfortunate thing about um, some schools is that they're just not hard enough on their students. And I only say that because I've seen a lot of portfolios of a lot of kids that come out of a lot of makeup schools and these kids come out thinking that they've done great work and obviously they weren't told it wasn't up to par. Um, and, I, and, and all of that is obviously taken with a grain of salt that like, hey, this is a kid from Ohio who just came out here and his first time doing this. Great, get it. But it's, it's our job as the teachers um, to, to make sure that we're really pushing them. You know, you, we can't just go, you know, oh yeah, yeah, that looks great, that looks great, that's great, you know, and, and thinking that I've got 20 other kids I've got to look at. It's, you know, it's just like, yeah, that looks great, but what do you see wrong with it, you know? I think the best thing that we can teach our, uh, teach our students are, are to have an edit, to be self-critical so that they can look at it and go like, yeah, my edge sucks here, this is bad, and I should have used this. And it's like, yeah, you know, try maybe try a couple of different colors, add more layers, do this and that, you know, work faster doing this so you have more time to work on that edge next time. I mean, it's, you, you can come at it at a way that is, um, I think, complementary to the person and their skill levels, um, but I think you have to be hard and it just sets them up for more success once they are out sure. in the, the sure. industry working. Yeah, because sure. They, and, and you know, and selfishly, I, you know, I have to look at it a different way where it's just like, okay, if I'm teaching a class and you know, there's a places that I have to, I've taught before where it's like, I'm teaching a class. This kid is going to walk out and say like, Oh, Brian Sipe taught me how to do this. And it's like, and if he does a real shitty job, then my name is now attached to that. So I want to make sure that, he or she leaves with the best that I can do. I can't just call it in, you know, that's just not fair, you know, for, my, for, for them or myself and my name later, you know, I mean, there's, you know, different ways to look at it, but, you know, but we have to, I mean, if I'm teaching, I got to know that I'm, I'm wanting to open the door for some, you know, for the future of, you know, what our business is. It's a great mindset to look at it because it's, it's not just a reflection on their work. It is a reflection on you and what you're putting out there because those people that you're teaching, that is your work. Sure. You know, you might not have painted it or sculpted it, but that is you and yeah. your educational work. So that's wonderful. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about more of your more recent high prof profile projects that, you know, li little tiny movies like Guardians of the Galaxy or X-Men, yeah, yeah. you know, the, you may have heard of them. I'm not sure. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm quite a fan of uh, these movies and the work that you've done. So uh, let's go with one of the more recent ones. Let's talk about Dark Phoenix. Um, yeah, I mean, for the X-Men series and uh, Jennifer Lawrence's character, Mystique, was the one that I was mostly focused on um, for, for those three movies that I worked on. We started with Days of Future Past. You know, I was working at Legacy Effects, and the mandate came down from the studios was that, you know, we needed to 
redo her look uh, from first class so that it, it could be something a little bit more uh, actor and production friendly. Um, I think they, they wanted to make it a lot faster, um, something that was a lot more comfortable for Jennifer and um, something that they knew that they couldn't abuse the, the future Oscar winner of Silver Lining Playbook. So um, they, you know, so, I mean, that was our job. And then, and then from there, we, we, you know, we did that same look in Apocalypse. I also was a, responsible for the Apocalypse character. And then um, in, in Dark Phoenix, uh, the, <clears throat> it was going to be, a, it was a new director, Simon, and uh, he wanted to kind of go back to one of the earlier designs for Mystique and kind of harken back some of those artistic values and, and, and kind of redo her makeup and look. They wanted to have you adjust it in order to make it more comfortable for your talent. What are the some of the considerations you have when you're creating a character, knowing that it's going to go on a human being that has to perform and emote? There are different things to consider when you're creating a makeup like that. One is, uh, I mean, obviously, you know, the overall design, you know, how well it looks like the character that you want it to be. One of the things that I always, you know, we always take into consideration is the actor's, you know, comfortability. You know, because they're going to have to, you know, we're going to have to get all get up at 3 a.m., hang around for two to three hours, put this, go through this, you know, process, and then work for 10, 12 hours, and, you know, and hope that makeup's got to stay on. So durability gets added to that. So we had to approach, you know, we had to just really just kind of like revamp the whole look to just kind of look look at all the tools we had to to make it that, make it better, faster, stronger. Lots to consider there. So you've done a lot now in the recent uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe, which is great. So uh, in Avengers uh, Infinity War and Endgame, which I had the most fun with when those came out last year because I was not a Marvel fan prior. Yeah. Uh, but right before those came out, because I knew they were a big deal, I sat down and watched everything. I was like, where have I been for a decade? Why have I not uh, did, did you start out like at, at Iron Man? You watched them from the beginning? Yeah, I watched or? them in chronological MCU timeline. Uh, yes, yes, okay. Uh, aside from Captain Marvel, because it wasn't out yet. What is it that was your, your focus on there? Because there's so much that happened in those movies that I'm sure there were a few different departments working on makeup. There, there was. Um, I mean, kind of the beginning of that all kind of starts with Guardians of the Galaxy 2. The same type of thing, the first one, I, I think, came out of left field. I mean, it came out of left field for me. I, like, I had not heard about it. I had not, I don't even think I read about it. Nobody talked about it. And then all of a sudden I saw billboards and then, you know, went and saw the first movie and, and was just blown away. It was just, you know, it's like, why had we not heard about this? You know, and, you know, and all the characters were great. The designs were great. Makeups were great. Actually, I was up on Apocalypse when I was in Montreal shooting that is when I got the call from uh, John Rosen Grant. We were asked to kind of, you know, take a second look at, at all the characters. Um, you know, uh, the teams in England did a great job with those designs. And, um, you know, I mean, they're iconic. I mean, they're, they're, they're all beautiful. And, uh, but again, you know, we were asked to, you know, like, how can we make the makeups faster? How can we make them, you know, last a little longer how, how can we you know what can we do so that and was I, our and that approach was specifically with your nebula character right wasn't there if improvements for for that character we we tried to improve all of them we had to i mean we we we, we, we did a pass on everybody mm -hmm. as far as taking um uh redoing them in in such a way to make them a little bit better or faster um uh, and whether it was just changing uh you know we redid sculptures um, Karen was a challenge for Nebula because when, obviously when she did the first film, she shaved her head and, you know, and, and, you know, she's a, she's a beautiful woman and she's got like this gorgeous hair and she didn't want to shave it anymore. <laughs> so, I mean, that was like our biggest uh, hurdle with her was, you know, how do we make it, how do we make that beautiful look, um, on, you know, with a non-shaved head. So um, we really had to kind of come out of the way. We, we, we did quite a few different versions of head wraps and ball caps and all kinds of ways to kind of come at it. Um, Alexi uh, Dimitriou and Chris Nelson were the two uh, makeup artists who led that character. And, um, you know, and I think they did, you know, a damn good job, you know, making her mane. I mean, she's got a you know giant mane of hair, make it go away. 
Yeah, it's fascinating because I, not knowing that, you know, like I figured she had shaved her head through all of the movies because it's so streamlined. So you guys yeah, did a great yeah. job. Yeah, yeah, it was not easy. It was not easy. I mean, <laughs> not- and in the later ones, in the later ones to Infinity War, we had a, a different hair person came in, Sean Smith, and, you know, her hair had grown even more. <laughs> so it just, you know, it was always just an ongoing chase, you know, just to see what we could do. Yeah, and then you were also part of Team Drax. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That was one of my favorite characters from the, from the first film. I mean, it's such a cool design. And um, so I kind of really took that one under wing and, and, um, and again, you know, it was, okay, how do we make this better and faster? Um, You know, I think, I think we did, you know, and still keep the integrity of the initial design, Um, you know, from the first film, you know, we, we just did a complete, complete re-sculpt. I really kind of flipped the whole application process and um you know whereas the first film uh it was a, like 24 different silicone prosthetics that you know went over him overlapping and, and kind of uh connecting prosthetics when i saw the film i thought it was you know prosthetic transfers um so then when it came time to you know for me to re- reapproach the look i mean that's what i went with um because i knew that you know, for, again, for, for a, a, a character like that, you know, if, if he's fully covered, you know, I mean, body heat is our worst enemy. So I wanted to give, you know, lots of uh, vent holes and windows through the prosthetics to, um, to make it so that he could just vent heat. Uh, so that's what we did as far as um, when we re-sculpted the prosthetics, we made it so that anywhere that you see like his grayish brown skin, that sculpture went straight to the board. So that was going to be an open window. So this whole mesh of scars, you know, there were just a lot of windows that would just be his skin to let his body heat out, to let him perspire. So uh, we didn't have bubbling issues. We didn't have, you know, uh, weird buckling issues and, and stuff like that. So wow, that's such a clever uh, fix for that because I wasn't sure, you know, not knowing how these things work. Like I, I didn't know if they were all like individual little scars or if it was like a body suit because it was so seamless it looked like it was really him yeah yeah i mean you know that was uh i mean you know, i know they wanted us to try that um but and and we did do a test version of it that just it just didn't it didn't go over as well putting the bodysuit on we figured okay well we have to let's at least do his arms because there's some things that always aren't forgiving when you're doing something like that that kind of gives the gag away and for me the cleanest look was to just make the transfers work and, you know, I think we did pretty good. I mean, you know, it was a thing where, you know, we had two original team members, um, Rob Pritchard and John Moore, who came over from England that were a part of the original Drax team, um, myself, and then a, a local out of Atlanta, uh, his name's Matt Sprunger. Every once in a while, we would pull in a fifth person to help trace and cut down, cut out the transfers. We, we took a makeup that would sometimes take anywhere from three and a half to four and a half, five hours in, you know, from the first film. And we brought it down to a consistent 70 minute makeup, which is, I think, it's pretty damn cool. I mean, that's that's like that's three hours more sleep. So um, <laughs> I was I was pretty happy about that. That's so impressive. And and another thing that you did in the the final Avengers movie was old Captain America, which was a something that I saw posted on your Instagram. So is that like a, a pride point? You know what that is. I, I mean, it, it was something that uh, I was really proud to be a part of. I mean, it was a great experiment. I think. Again, Legacy Effects uh, was commissioned to do part of the old days. We were working hand in hand with Lola, a digital effects company. Th- there were some some items on an actor sometimes that they felt like, well, there are some super subtleties that happen around the eyes. There are some super subtleties that happen when someone swallows and, and some things that like, so you guys, if you guys do these portions of the face, we can connect the dots and make it all work as an old age makeup. So that's what we did. Um, uh, Jason Matthews uh, at Legacy sculpted, you know, the pieces, which were done beautifully. You know, it was a neck piece. Um, it was a, a kind of a, a lower eye bag and um, crow's feet area, part of the cheeks, upper eye lids uh, with partial brow that we actually had punched in um, brows. And then, you know, a bald pate and then, you know, and then the hair department provided a wig. So really just his cheeks and his nose were the only thing that were of him showing. You see it in the picture on my Instagram. And then from there, they were, you know, the digital company went in and added the rest. They filled in the gaps. 
they squeezed him, you know, so that he looked like he had the, the right amount of, you know, gravity loss. And um, it, was, it was pretty cool. I mean, it was pretty cool to be a part of that. It was, it was nice to be a part of that hand holding session where, you know, we actually worked with, you know, the people who steal our work. <laughs> well, speaking of that, so the collaboration of traditional practical makeup and digital, now mm -hmm. that we're seeing a lot, and I'm sure, you know, given your breadth of work, you've dealt with that a lot uh, in your recent career. How is that going? How does that feel? And what do you suggest for people who are coming into the makeup industry to deal with that? For me, like that was a great experience in it, um, doing being a part of Old Cap um, and, uh, you know, but it's, it, we're at a, we're at a point, we're at a tipping point, I think in our industry where things can change. Um, you know, uh, I go back to a story, um, from Terminator Genesis where we were, it was like the old, or I mean, excuse me, it was the, uh, the younger version of the T-800 of the Arnold guy walking across this one, you know, bridge. And he was supposed to, you know, get some bullet hits across his chest. And um, it was gonna happen. And then we were gonna go in and put the prosthetics on. Uh, it was just gonna be, I think it was three prosthetic transfer bullet hits. They came, we're getting ready to do it. We're all set up. And the AD comes up and he's like, okay, we're gonna do this shot. We're gonna do that. You guys can take him and do your makeup. How long is that gonna take? And we're just like, yeah, 15 minutes, you know? And they're like, okay, can you do it any faster? And we're like, 15 minutes is pretty quick. Uh, there are three of us here. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll triple team them. We'll, we'll try and do it in under 10, you know? And then the VFX guy chimes in and just goes, we'll do it later in post. And I'm just like, it's three bullet hits, three prosthetic chance for bullet hits. I'm like, I'm like, guys, our trailer's right there. You guys yell cut when you walk them back out, you do that, you continue the shot. And then they're just like, no, we'll just do it later in post. So, I mean, the environment that we're in these days is that, you know, I mean, I guess the one thing that I would love to have known is like how much that cost in post later, because you know that it was not cheap. Um, and it would have literally been 10 minutes work, 15 minutes work, <laughs> you know. Uh, but, but the environment is that we as makeup artists, I think, I mean, my, my soapbox these days is we have to be better and faster. Um, because even something simple like that will go away. I, I, I mean, I really think gone are the days of, of the Dick Smith eight hour makeups. Um, you know, once in a while, you, you know, and depending upon who you are, you might be able to command and go like, hey, it's just gonna take what it's gonna take. But, you know, the way that digital is, is so pervasive and, and just taking over different parts of our world, we have to be careful. We have to be better because at this point in time, they're becoming better. You know, you look at Thanos, and Thanos is an incredible feat for the digital world. Um, all, the, a lot of, all the digital effects that were in, you know, Infinity War and Endgame are, are pretty amazing. Um, but he's, he's incredibly believable. I'm sure he was incredibly expensive, but, but still, that stuff incrementally gets faster and cheaper <laughs> you know, as, as their industry moves along. You know, I know that there are companies out there and there are actors that have it in their, um, their contracts now. You know, they have the VFX clause where it's just kind of like they're watching the cut of the film and go like, ah, oh, yeah, you know, I, I couldn't sleep that weekend. So my dark circles under the eyes, make sure you take those out. You know, uh, puffy eyes there, take those out. Crow's feet, take them out. I mean, it's stuff that's happening that, happens in a lot of films these days. So I, I think that's just something that we we have to be careful of. Is there anything that you suggest to the up and coming artists to try and future proof themselves a little bit? I, again, I think be self-critical. I think make yourself good. Don't do something and think that it's awesome. <laughs> you know, I, I think that that's one of the biggest problems of, of that, especially younger artists do these days. Um, is that they do something and they think it's great. You know, maybe mom and dad and uncle in, in North Dakota think it's great and that's, that's fantastic, but it, they're not your competition, you know? Um, one of the last talks I gave at a, at a school, you know, I, I had all the kids look around the classroom and I just said, take a look. Every single person in this room is your competition. If you're not better than the person sitting next to you, you're not gonna work, 
you know, Home Depot's hiring, you know, but it's like it, that that's the truth. And then you got to think that, you know, then, and you know, the six months before that, there was 30, 40 other kids. And then before that there are 30, 40. And then after this, there's going to be 30, 40 other kids. So you have to be good. You can't just think that you went through a course and that's all I needed to do. You know, I mean, you guys, at the, you know, the schools, you know, the teachers, hopefully they've laid the great groundwork. They've taught what they can. These are all the tools. These are all the materials. But it's really, it's up to the student to just go home and practice, practice, practice. And if they don't do that, I can guarantee you they will fail. Yeah, that's great advice because it's a competitive artistic realm. And you're not only competing with your other makeup artists, you're competing with other industries at this point. Yes, absolutely. So before we wrap it up, just because you've got the sweater on, you you are the <laughs> makeup department head for The Mandalorian. So talk to me a little bit about that project. That was an awesome project. I mean, it was, you know, that's, you know, obviously I'm old enough to have been around when, you know, the first Star Wars came out in theaters. And, um, you know, I mean, that was truly a life-changing film for a lot of people. And to be able to be a part of one of those on our soil was pretty amazing. Um, and, uh, you know, again, given the responsibility um, to, you know, do a, to be department of everything, was, it was great, you know, I, you know, but again, I've got a great team, you know, so, uh, you know, I, I help, you know, push things forward and manage. And um, I guess that's one thing too, uh, another, something else I could leave you guys with is that, uh, you know, for those who, who, who want to be a good department head, um, you know, hire the right people. Don't hire your friend. Uh, don't hire the most talented. Um, I think you hire people that work together well. I will gladly hire somebody who's less experienced and not as talented if you get along with the group. Um, and everybody plays nice, everybody gets along, everybody takes direction, everybody critiques each other, you know, um, and you know, that's just the best way to make a team. Yeah, I love that. And I love the concept of hiring based on the team overall. Absolutely. And, and for any, any of these shows like that, you know, you guys are stuck together for four months. You know, it's like, who do you want to play with for four months? Great advice. Uh, any last bits of knowledge you'd like to drop on our viewers? You know, again, any advice that I could give is to be very realistic about where you're at. Be very realistic about your talents because then you will be able to be realistic about what you need to do to get better. Pick a goal, you know, pick it to pick somebody who you want to emulate, pick somebody, you know, find somebody that you want to, you know, whether it's a virtual mentor mentorship or somebody that you can talk to, but find somebody that you, you want to be so that you can, you know, choose a path um, and, uh, and work really hard to follow that path. Delightful advice. Thank you again so much for chatting with us today. If you guys want more information about Brian and his career, head to briansype.com and they can also find uh, you on Instagram. What is your Instagram handle? Uh, Brian Sype Makeup. Brian Sype Makeup. So make sure you guys really? <laughs> follow him and check out his work. And uh, if you haven't seen uh, his work yet, then you've been living under a rock. But otherwise, you've got time right now to watch a whole bunch of movies. Yeah, lots of time. Watch them all. Head to his website, look at his resume, and just start watching those films. So we'll catch you guys in the next interview. Thank you so much, and we will see you next time. Thank you.